Chapter 3 Jackson leaned back in the saddle, and Samson obediently slowed, then stopped as they topped the ridge. The stallion was of old earth Morgan ancestry, with a more than a little genetic engineering to increase his lifespan and intelligence. And he was as happy as Jackson to be away from the fields. Samson didn't exactly object to pulling a plow, since he grasped the link between cultivated fields and winter fodder. But he wasn't well suited to the task as, say, Florence, the big placid Pertrin mare. Besides, he and Jackson had been a team for over five local years. They both enjoyed the rare days when they returned to Luce to explore, and exploration was of far more important to Devereaux's setting than most of the others. Devereaux was the newest and furthest west of all of Ararat settlements. It was also small, with a current population of only 81 humans and their animals. But it had excellent water, more than enough for irrigation if it turned out Doc Gann's prediction was inaccurate after all, and rich soil. Nor did it hurt, he thought even more smugly, that the Devereaux clan tended to produce remarkably good-looking offspring. The steading attracted a steady enough trickle of newcomers that Rory could afford to be picky about professional and genetic credentials, despite the fact it was less than 20 kilometers from one of the old battlefields. That was what had brought Jackson and Samson out in this direction. Before her shuttles gave up the ghost, Commodore Perez had ordered an aerial survey of every battlefield within 2,000 kilometers of landing to map radiation threats, check for biohazards, perhaps, most importantly, look very, very carefully for any sign of still active combat equipment. They'd found some of it too. Three of Sam's shuttles had been blown apart by automated Malconian air defense batteries, but they'd also turned up eight operable human armored troop carriers and two dozen unarmored Malconian transport skimmers. Those had been and still were pretty invaluable as cargo vehicles. But the very fact they remained operational after 40 odd standard years underscored the reason the old battle sites still made people nervous. If they were still functional, the surveys might have missed something else that was. No one wanted to disturb anything which could wreak the havoc that had destroyed both Ararat's original inhabitants and their attackers. Yet Commodore Perez had known it'd be impossible for Ararat's growing human population to steer clear of all the battlefields. There were too many of them spread too widely over Ararat's surface. For that, she'd located her first settlement with what appeared to be the primary human LZ on this continent. Between it and the areas where the Malconians had dug in, Hopefully, anything that was still might be active would be of human manufacture and less likely to kill other humans on sight. Unfortunately, no one could be sure things would work out that way, which was why Jackson was here. He pulled off his hat to mop his forehead while he tried to convince himself and Samson. The sight below really didn't make him nervous, but the way the horse snorted and stamped suggested he wasn't fooling Samson any more than himself. Still, this is why they'd come to explore and he'd wiped the sweat band of his hat dry, replaced it on his head almost defiantly, and sent Samson trotting down the long, shallow slope. At least 60 standard years had passed since the war had ended on Ararat, and wind and weather had worked to erase its scars, yet they couldn't hide what had happened here. The hulk of a human Xenophon-class transport still loomed on its landing legs, towering hull riddled by wounds big enough for Jackson to have ridden Samson through, and seven more ships. Six Xenophons and a seventh whose wreckage Jackson couldn't identify lay scattered about the site. They were even more terribly damaged than their single sister who had managed to stay upright, and the ground itself was one endless pattern of overlapping craters and wreckage. Jackson and Samson picked their way cautiously into the area. This was his fifth visit, but his inner shiver was still cold as he studied the broken weapons pits and personnel trenches and the wreckage of combat and transport vehicles. The only way to positively certify the safety of this site was to physically explore it, and getting clearance from Rory and the colony admin had been hard. His earlier explorations had skirted the actual combat zone without ever entering it, but this time he and Samson would make their way clear across it, straight down its long axis, and if nothing jumped out and ate them, the site would be pronounced safe. He grinned nervously as he thought about he grinned nervously at the thought, which seemed much more amusing to him before he set out this morning and eased himself into the saddle. Some of his tension had relaxed, and he leaned forward to pat Samson's shoulders. He felt fresh confidence flow into him. He had to get Rory out here, he decided. There was a lot more equipment than the old survey suggested, and there was almost something worthwhile to salvage in this much wreckage. Time passed, minutes trickling away into a silence broken only by the wind, the creak of saddle leather, and the breathing of man and horse. 
and the occasional ring of a horseshoe against some shard of wreckage. They were a third of the way across the LZ when Jackson pulled up once more and dismounted. He took a long drink from his water bottle and poured a generous portion into his hat, then held it to Samson to drink while he looked around. He could trace the path of the Malconians' attack by the trail of their own broken and shattered equipment, to see where they'd battered their way through the human perimeter from the west. Here and there he saw the power armor of the human infantry, or bits and pieces of it, but his attention was always drawn back to the huge shape which dominated the dreadful scene. The bolo should have looked asymmetrical, or at least unbalanced, with all of its main turrets concentrated on the forward third of its length, but it didn't. Of course, its 30 meter wide hull measured just under 140 meters from cliff-like bow to its aftermost anti-personnel clusters. That left plenty of mass to balance the even turrets that they were 4 meters tall and 16 across, and the central and forward ones appeared intact, ready to traverse their massive weapons at any second. The shattered after turret was another matter and the rest of the bolo was far from unhurt. Passing years it drifted the soil high on its 10 meter high tracks, but it couldn't hide the gap in its forward outboard starboard tread bogies or the broad twisted ribbon where it run completely off its rear inboard port track. Its port secondary battery had been badly damaged, with two of its seven 20 centimeter hellboards little more than shattered stubs, while a third drooped tiredly at maximum depression. Anti-personnel clusters were rent and broken, multi-barreled rail guns, and laser clusters were frozen at wildly varying elevations and angles of train. While it was invisible from here, Jackson had seen the mighty war machine's death wound on its first visit. The hole wasn't all that wide, but he couldn't begin to imagine the fury had taken to punch any hole straight through two meters of solid dura alloy. Yet, the gutted Melconian Fenris in front of the bolo had done it, and Jackson shivered again as he gazed at the two huge, once sentient machines. They stood there, Less than a kilometer apart, main batteries still trained on one another, like some hideous memorial to the war in which they'd both died. He sighed and shook his head. The final war was the universal nightmare of an entire galactic arm. Yet it wasn't quite real to him in the way it was to say his father, mother, or grandparents. He had been born here on Ararat, where the evidence of the war was everywhere to be seen and burn its way viscera deep into everyone who beheld it. But that violence was in the past. It frightened and repelled him, just as the stories of what happened to humanity's worlds filled him with rage. Yet, when he looked out over the slowly eroding carnage before him and saw that massive dead shape standing where it had died in the service of man, he felt strange. Regret? Awe? Neither word was quite correct, but each of them was part of it. It was as if he had missed something he knew intellectually was horrible. Yet his gratitude at being spared the horror of was flawed by the sense of missing the excitement, the terror, the knowledge that what he was doing mattered, that victory or defeat, life or death, of his entire race depended upon him. It was a stupid thing to feel and he knew that too. He had only to look at the long ago carnage frozen about him for that. But he was also young, and the suspicion that war can be glorious despite its horror is the property of the young and the blessedly inexperienced. He reclaimed his hat from Samson and poured the last trickle of water from it over his own head before he put it back on and swung back into the saddle. Something flickers deep within me. For just an instant, I believe it is only one more dream. Yet this is different. It is sharper, clearer, and familiar. Its whisper flares at the heart of my sleeping memory like a silent bomb, and long quiescent override programming springs to life. A brighter stream of electrons rushes through me like a razor-sharp blade of light and psychotronic synapses quiver in a sharp, painful moment of all too much clarity as my personality center comes back online at last. A jagged bolt of awareness flashes through me, and I arouse. I wake. For the first time in 71.53 years, I am alive, and I shouldn't be. I sit motionless, giving no outward sign of the sudden chaos raging within me, for I am not yet capable of more. That will change. I already know that much. Yet it cannot change quickly enough, for the whisper of enemy battle codes sees quietly through subspace as his units murmur to one another yet again. I strain against my immobility, yet I am helpless to speed my reactivation. Indeed, a 2.33 second damage survey inspires a sense of amazement that reactivation is even possible. The plasma bolt which ripped through my glacius did dreadful damage, terminal damage, to my personality center and main CPU but its energy dissipated 11.1 centimeters short of my central damage control CPU. In human terms, 
it lobotomized me without disabling my autonomous functions, and CDC subroutines activated my repair systems without concern for the fact that I was brain dead. My power subsystems remained online in CDC local control, and internal remotes began repairing the most glaring damage. But the damage to my psychotronics was too extreme for anything so simple as repair. More than half of the 2 meter sphere of my molecular circuitry brain, denser and harder than an equal volume of nickel steel, was blown away. And by all normal standards, its destruction should have left me instantly and totally dead. But the nanotech features of the Mark 33D's CDC have far exceeded my designer's expectations. The nannies had no spare parts, but they did have a complete schematic and no equivalent of imagination to tell them that their task was impossible. They also possessed no more sense of impatience than haste or urgency, and they have spent over the 70 years scavenging non-essential portions of my interior, breaking them down and restructuring them, exuding them as murdered Terra's corals built their patient reefs. And however long they may have required, they have built well, not perfectly, but well. The jolt as my survival center uploads my awareness to my personality center is even more abrupt than my first awakening on Luna. For reasons which become clear as self-test programs flicker, my personality center and main CPU are functional at only 86.31% of design capacity. This is barely within acceptable parameters for a battle-damaged unit, and totally unacceptable for a unit returned to duty from repair. My cognitive functions are compromised, and there are frustrating holes in my gestalt. In my handicapped state, I require a full 1.99 seconds to realize portions of that gestalt have been completely lost, forcing CDC to reconstruct them from original activation codes stored in main memory. I am unable at this time to determine how successful the CDC's reconstructions have been, yet they lack the experiential overlay of the rest of my personality. I experience a sense of incompletion which is distracting. Almost worse, I am alone, without the neural links to my commander which made us one. The emptiness Diego should have filled aches within me, and the loss of processing capability makes my pain and loss far more difficult to cope with. It is unfortunate that the CDC could not have completed physical repairs before rebooting my systems, for the additional 1.369% of capacity would have aided substantially in my efforts to reintegrate my personality. But I understand why the CDC has activated emergency restart now, instead of waiting till 100% of capacity. More test programs blossom, but my current status amounts to a complete crash level systems restart. It will take time for all subsystems to report their functionality, and until they do, my basic programming will not release them to main CPU control. The entire process will require an excess of 2.9 or 2 hours, yet there is no way to hasten it. Jackson completed his final sweep with a sense of triumph he was still young enough to savor. He and Samson cantered back the way they'd come with far more confidence crossing the battle area once more as Ararat's sun sank in the west, and the first moon rose pale in the east. They trotted up the slope in which he'd ridden with such inwardly denied trepidation that morning, and he turned in his saddle to look once more behind him. The bolo loomed against the setting sun, its still gleaming, imperishable dura alloy black now against the crimson sky, and he felt the stab of guilt at abandoning it once more. It wouldn't matter to the bolo, of course, any more than to the humans who had died here with it, but to the looming war machine seemed a forlorn sentinel to all of humanity's dead. Jackson had long since committed the designation of its central turret to memory, and he waved one hand at the dead LZ's lonely guardian in an oddly formal gesture, almost a salute. All right, Unit 1097's SHV, we're going now. He clucked to Samson, and the stallion nickered cheerfully as he headed back towards home.